Ready your dice and graph paper. Light the torches and grab thy ten-foot pole. It's time once again to dungeon dive with the Mythwits. Mint- 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 the Mythwits. The right, uh, The show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I am your host, Peter Bryant. And joining me this week on this episode is my co-host, Mike Kafis. I just want to say two things, all right? First, was it me? I, I didn't do it this time. And second <laughs> of all, second of all, like you know, had like, you had like three weeks, two, three weeks that you weren't driving and you're all like, you know, your wheel's a little shaky, isn't it? No, I just, you know, I, I'm flustered, flustered. All right, Continue. Anyway. <laughs> Our guest this week is Eric Frankhaus. Hey, Eric. Hey, buddy. How Eric, are we doing today? Doing My all fault. Right. My doing fault. All right. It's, we're a little late, but that's okay. <laughs> Eric uh, Eric Frankhouse presents, produces tabletop uh, products in the form of audio guided adventures, how to podcast, consulting, and paid storytelling. He is a three-time, check this out, Mike, three-time Iron GM uh, and a drinker of beer. But yeah, what's, I am both those. You are the only Iron GM at, the world, at, at Gen Con to score a perfect score. Is that correct? At Gen Con, yeah, I'm still the only perfect score. I'm it, right. which is yeah. I did not think that group was going to be a perfect score. Okay, I did not you, feel like the, that at the table. You're the Bobby Flay of yeah. uh, DMing, huh? Okay. Yeah, uh, gotcha. kind of. I was going for a hat trick and I didn't get it last year. So, okay, so we, yeah, uh, we, uh, so Chris Pierce took it at Total Con with a perfect score, and I think he was the only yep. one at Total Con to ever take it with a perfect score, but. Uh, that's not Gen Con because Gen Con is the world. That's that's it. That's the that's the that's, that's the world championship. That's, that's right. the show. The that's show. The WWE belt that we actually do pass out. Nice, nice, <laughs> very cool. All right, well let's get let's get into the show because we're running a little bit late, but that's okay. It's all right. Nobody's making any money off this show, so no bills are not going to get. Wait, paid. we're not getting paid. <laughs> no, I'm not paid. Oh, you, you may get paid. We don't. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so Eric is, he's an, he's an RPG, uh, aficionado and geek. Uh, and I'm this, I've been looking forward to this show because so am I, Eric, and I have, have talked at, uh, Gary Khan a few times, yep. uh, sat and drank beers and shot the shit for hours on end about gaming and game design and all that good stuff. So this should be a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, in, in, we're, so we do the show note thing where we, we, uh, uh, quiz our guests on what they want to talk about. And, sure. um, uh, one of the things that, that Eric is big on, and I am too, is RPGs and modern technology. Yep. Um, so I remember, so Mike, I don't know if you remember back in the day, back in, I mean, we're going to go way, way back, like 1999. Do you remember I was talking about uh, PDFs? And I was like, oh man, PDFs are going to be this shit. You could put all of your game books on like a computer or a laptop or something, and you could take every game book you own, all of them. In one computer, yeah. you don't have to carry on a big yeah. book bag. And John yeah. said, eh, I, don't, "I don't like that. I like to, I like to feel the page, I like to thumb yeah. through yeah. them." Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I was like, no, nobody's gonna use books at the table anymore. One day, well, I mean, some people still do, but a lot of people have, have bought into this PDF uh, thing, um, yeah. which was especially Not that's the technology now. Not our Johnny. No. So, well, no, no, John. Yeah. John loves PDFs now. So, oh. so one of the things that you brought up was that, uh, you know, are, are PDFs worth, like these, these PDFs that come out that are like 20 and 30 bucks. Yeah. Um, with, with nothing, but they're just a PDF. Like, is that yep. worth it? So, so here's my thought behind that question in general. Uh, there are two specific PDFs I'm talking about. One is an intellectual property that they obviously had to pay for to get, which is The Witcher. They put that out. That book was, I think, $35 on launch. It didn't even have a table of contents, and nothing is hyperlinked inside of it. Cool. You had to pay for the Witcher thing, and I get it that CD Projekt Red is doing cyberpunk, and you guys did a little flip-flop, whatever. Then you have, uh, what is it, uh, Dark Matter that came out, 5e sci-fi game, ran the first game yesterday, and that is a kickstarter Mage Hand Press third-party publisher, 25 bucks. For a PDF, no hyperlink. At least they had an index in theirs. Why so? Is it because you're not selling your books and you're trying to make profit? At least go the extra mile to make that PDF interactive. Yes. 
like Monty Cook Games is a prime example of that. Everything in their books are hyperlinked. You click something and it takes you to the chapter you're in. No D and D five year where it's like go look up swimming. Oh, page one sixty two. Now go look at page one twenty three. Like it's hyperlinked. Why wouldn't Even you the, do that? A yes. goddamn dead tree book has an index. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. You know, like like in the back where you have like you have your. Um... You know, your, your, what is your, uh, I guess the index goes in the back, right? Table the index, yeah. front, index in the back, yeah. So your yep. index should all be linked. Like, Correct. It's super easy. You just hotkey it and done. Right. And there, I think there are some programs that'll just do that, right? Aren't there like. So there's some that are really good at it. Scrivener is probably my favorite for writing outside of collaborative design. I still use Google Docs because everybody can get on it. I don't have yes. to worry about what they own. After we take it from that point and we need to move on, I'll put it in Scrivener. And that one, you can key term things, and when you go to port it out to InDesign, you can make it so that it goes, hey, all these words, I want these to be hyperlinked to this page, and you pick the one you want it hyperlinked to. It takes time, and I know you're so tired of working on the book you don't want to index, <laughs> but just do it. Like Hire somebody. On. Hire yeah. somebody to do it. Jeez. It's expensive. Indexing is expensive, but if you yeah. do it from the beginning, it's not that bad. Right. It really isn't. And here's the so, other thing: if you're gonna do a, if you're gonna do your book on Kickstarter, which almost everybody's mm -hmm. doing nowadays, so your book, right, should be mm -hmm. done before your Kickstarter starts, or right? near done, like paying for art, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Right. Right. It should be near done. It should be written. Right. While your That's Kickstarter's running, and you're like, hey, I'm funded. Maybe I should take this time yep. to do the indexing, indexing and put all the art in and all that stuff. Yep. Everyone knows what control F is. You can literally go, oh, we invented a new term that's called like warping, whatever it is. Right. Control F, warping. Find the one that is the definition in your book, go to the back and link it. That's all you're doing. Right. It's not, it's so not hard. And I think you could go a step further. Do you guys ever buy uh, the print your own terrain? I don't know if any of you guys are miniature gamers at all. I have not. I'm, I'm not. I like miniature gaming, but I don't. I show up and I play other people's miniature games. Okay, so when you play tabletop, do you guys use terrain at all, or do you just use flat mats? Sometimes. Okay, so for the printable terrain, there was a company to put out one where it had layers on the left in your PDF, and you click it, and it would do things like turn grime on, turn grime off, turn heraldry on, turn heraldry off. So you could have like five different buildings out of one for a city. I don't know why they're not doing that for the information for different systems. Oh, so we have a friend, Nick, who's been on this show before. I don't know if you've ever met Nick Palmer, Dr. Nick. He um, Yeah, I know Dr. Nick. I was talking yeah. to him about his uh, his Patreon he was doing. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. So we had he, a little, little couple meetings. All his books were layered. Yeah. And he would do, like, uh, multiple systems. So he would have, you know, let's say it was it's uh, Savage Worlds and, and I don't fudge know, D &D and... or Fudge or whatever. Right? Yep, yep. And, and whatever system you were playing, you would turn that layer on, and it would the book would be for that. Exactly, exactly. So like, I would pay twenty five bucks for that. Hell yeah! Because that means that I can have like for I think setting books are perfect for that. Like if a new setting's coming out, I would love to get that setting in three different systems. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, Dave, David Benavides says hi. Hey David, how you doing, buddy? I just did some did some map work for him recently. Oh, really? He's another okay. Iron GM, actually. Yes, he is. Uh, that, that's why I let him say hi, because he's oh. a fellow. A fellow oh. Yeah. So, I guess so, that's okay. We're so enemies, have you, though. Have you, have no, you you're been out frenemies. To, have you ever been out to uh, Total Con at all? No. I So I do a lot of conventions a year. Right. I probably do right. 12 to 15 right now. Ooh. And it's not one that I go to. Like, I leave tomorrow to fly to Orlando for MegaCon. Wow. Holy yeah, you you got to come to Total Con, though, man. Come on. I, it's it's been on the roster. The problem I have is so when is Total Con? Uh, it's it's February, Total RPG. Week of February. Oh, a win. February. So in February, it used to be I was helping a gentleman run his convention. That convention has now moved to June, so it could happen because Lou Agresta and Roan want me to come out for it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Hey, you want you want the perfect sweep? Huh? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would be fun. I do love going to new conventions. I like meeting new people. I found coast to coast gaming is very different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, the the Totocon crew, holy crap. Pristine. Mm -hmm. They are fantastic. That's yeah. how I feel about uh, Gamehole Con in Madison. Alex yeah. runs one of the smoothest conventions I've ever been to. Yeah. Uh, we really want to get out there, too. That is an amazing convention if you've not been there. I have not. We we've yeah. we've had Alex on the show a couple of times talking about yeah. talking he's about good it. Stuff. He's a good guy. Yeah. 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 
All right. So, so what, like, technology wise, right? I mean, how, what, sure. what else could what else could we do? I mean, we got PDFs, we got indexing. I have a bunch of stuff. Um, like, like, what other kind of neat ideas would you do uh, well, technology wise? Well, I say I there's a lot of problems I have with them. I think some of the biggest new things that we did that are awesome are the integration of soundscape and tabletop audio. Those are a great way to add immersion to your game. But why aren't they just linked into the PDF so you can click the audio file and it plays? So, like, if I'm in the, if I'm running an adventure, a published adventure, and that published adventure is like, you enter a dungeon and it says audio cue and it has a little box there, and you click that box and it plays the audio and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. Why isn't that stuff like pre queued up so you're you're giving more? And I think we're moving more to the storytelling experience that we see in cinema versus the dungeon crawling. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with dungeon crawling, but as a whole, we've kind of went to this more collaborative or at least more group storytelling feel. But having like immersed audio that could be added would be amazing. I think having custom soundtracks come out for adventures when they come out. Paizo does that on a level. They have Soundscape do their stuff. But I would love to see that happen. You can. I literally mixed music on GarageBand on my phone with the pre-made stuff for a sci-fi game we were making in 10 minutes while sitting on the toilet. And let me tell you, you know, game designers, if you're independent game designer, you know, not, not a lot of them have a lot of money, right? A lot of these no, people, yeah. they work full-time jobs, they do this as a hobby, they may not even make any money off their games, or, or very little, and that's fine, they love doing Correct. it, that's fine. But, you can still afford to do some of this stuff, there are, there are places, a place like Fiverr, Fiverr.com is a fantastic resource. Especially for third-party publishers and startups, hands down, 100% with you. And right. pranking your friends for birthday wishes. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. What? Yeah, I, 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 they had this guy uh, one year for Mike's birthday. I, I paid this guy like ten bucks to to sing Happy Birthday in a th- in like a the Borat thong thing for Mike. It was uh, okay. It was a beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. We oh, yeah. uh, we've done similar things. Uh, so other other things that could be great. I love maps that are preset up for like Roll Twenty. A lot of us play online now. When you can't get around a table. I love that. And some of the companies make it to where your shadow layers are set up. So, like, you can turn your dynamic lighting on and off. I wish that would come out more with adventures for virtual tabletops. Um, I think token kits and handouts digitally would be great. Uh, Most people have a printer, but what they always make the mistake of is including it in the book, and now you're holding cut down and trying to copy and paste it and send it to people, you know, on Discord or however you play. Why aren't those just in a file with a proper name? So you can be like, hand out one, hand out two, hand out three, hand out four. And you can just send them to your players at the table. Yeah. These are, this is just really remodeling what you already have in your book. Hey, Pete, you know, I, I didn't add this to the show notes, but I thought if it was pertinent, I would mention it. And uh, yet... Again, it seems like it is. So, uh, what do you guys think about? And uh, Eric, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Pete, we know about our, our friend uh, Robert, who uh, Keith Rob- Robertson, who has uh, Archivos. Are you familiar with yes. Archivos? No, the name does not sound familiar. It is a uh, Dave. Pete, Dave, you mean Dave Robeson? Yeah. Did, did I? What did I say? You said Keith. Keith. Yeah, our buddy Dave Robeson. I thought Dave you said Archivos. Robinson. So. Yeah. Oh boy, he screwed it all up, Mike. Anyway, how about how about how about how about Sure, perfect. That Mike, a little bit. You're you're blowing it out. So yes, Dave. Dave has this thing called Archivos, and it okay. is it's like it's like a wiki setup. So you put in characters, you put in maps, you put in locations and items, all that stuff, and you can key all the stuff and link it all together. And so like you can go to the map and you can go to a city and you can click on it and it'll pop out everybody in your adventure that's connected yeah. with that city. You can also create timelines, so you can go through a timeline of uh you know and see what npcs are like connected a, to pcs yeah like it's, it's like a chronicler chronicler yeah. for all of your stuff that's yes. pretty cool yeah there's it's, another uh, company that's doing that right now i think called world anvil i think that's the other yeah. one that is doing something very similar but it's really set up for the publisher end. i don't know if your friends does that as well where yeah let's say you publish yeah. an adventure yes. you can pull things out that's awesome yeah and that's and i think that is just um right now we're the in the early adoption phase yeah and trying to get on... gamers to change they're working on currently. I think uh, if we remember correctly. They're working on currently putting sound in, so yeah. that'll be that a would thing. Be awesome, real and soon. I'm, you know what? It's it's only a matter of time before someone hits on the right technology, and it's not going to be for gamers. Probably, it's sure. going to be for something else. But gamers will adopt it. A right. pad, like a giant touch screen pad that you can lay out on a table that's cheap enough for anyone to afford. Maybe even it rolls up and it 
It wouldn't even have to have like super high definition quality. It has to be like decent, you know, mm -hmm. um, where you could just lay it out on the table and you could have all kinds of stuff and the game master could, could take stuff from like his tablet or his laptop or whatever and just send them out onto the... Uh, onto so you the think like a roll-up screen is what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's we're... a time for something like that happens. CES this year I went to, we're, we're a little ways from that. They just finally made rolling TVs that come out of a dock. Yeah, uh -huh. We're a little bit for that, but you could make better tabletop projectors. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are pretty costly. Remember, remember the phones that came out with projectors on them for a while? Yeah. 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 You could make yeah. something easy that's a USB projector that plugs in on a stand and you could project onto a table. That would even be a great start because it's portable. Right. Holy shit. The uh, CES this year, if you were there, what about that one? Uh, was it Samsung that did the TV or LG that the did roll? the uh, transparent TV? I didn't see that. I just saw the roll and the stupid bread maker. No, no. This this was a TV that you could see from both sides. No. Oh, that's just got to yeah. be a dual monitor. That has to be like a dual no. screen setup. No. Really? Mm -hmm. I totally yeah. missed that. That's amazing. So it was like space. Wow. It was like like the space shows where you see like the screen comes up and you can see the person through the screen. Yeah. Yeah, but you can still yeah. see. So that's that's a projection display. That's pretty sweet. That's I, nice. I yes, we can't afford that as game. Like no, we can barely get no. gamers at the table to buy books. The GM does it all. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's, I it's, almost put that up for one of I the think questions. It, I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna get to a point though, where in the near future, ten years from now, sure, mm -hmm. we'll, it will have. I don't know. T or or, or, or uh, everybody will have tables that are just computers. You know, computer displays. Like it'll yes. just be part of your home. Like everyone will have one. It'll, oh, we see it all those people for building gaming, tables. It'll just be for whatever. Yeah, everyone's building tables like right now. They have the LCDs in their tabletops. Right. Like, look how many of those the blueprints that are out there you can buy online right now. No. Oh, God, Paul Nunn said porn will get us there. You're probably right, Paul. You're probably um, right. So, yeah, but I ain't so, eating at that table. I will. It's okay. So, side note, I, so I own an AR company with a really good friend of mine. We worked in the video game industry together. So we're doing a lot of AR stuff, not for tabletop yes. gaming. It's totally okay. separate, but... Unfortunately, right. The porn industry is the early adopter for everything. Everything. Yep. yep. All VR, all AR, all everything. It's ridiculous what they're doing right now. So if they're the early adopter, bravo, do a Kickstarter, get everyone's right. money, and then find a way to port it over gaming for us. Yeah, hell yeah. Porn. <laughs> Give it to us, porn. We want it. Anyway, we so want it. <laughs> we'll take the porn too. But, uh, uh, yeah, so you know, so <laughs> So let, let's talk about – we talked about – we mentioned Kickstarter. Let's talk about how Kickstarters have changed the self-publishing market. You know, it's – it's um, yeah. it's it's complete – it's a – Kickstarter completely changed everything. I think I'm, I think it tenfolded the industry for third-party publishers. Like, you now aren't doing it as a side project. You can be full-time. Sure. You know, your, your publishers like TPK Games is out there, what Legendary has done. These really classy, solid third-party publishers are just – murdering it right now because of Kickstarter. Without it, I don't think they would have been able to take their tiny audience and really blow it into something. No. And Kickstarter, and I mean, you guys, I know you're, you're old enough to remember this, it's no different than going to like JCPenney as a kid and having something on layaway. Yeah. They basically yeah, took the much. layaway model and blew it up into an early VC model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people giving you little amounts of money and paying for what it is over a course of time. Like, they, they found a way to do it, and it's awesome. And um, I wish people taught better classes and ethics so like we have the chicago guide and the writing style guide someone needs to make one for kickstarter because a lot of people are truly screwing it up yeah mm -hmm. and, and it is damaging other people, other people. like yes like, i'm not going to mention any names because i don't need libel suits or anything like that but there is a we're guy not getting paid a, though there is a guy whose initials are kw who is a asshole who is like making a bad name for kickstarter stuff and he just Correct. keeps doing it and people keep giving him money and i don't understand it yeah and there's big but there's also big companies that have went back to the well too often too frequently and and botched the products they're putting out and they're well-named companies that we had respect for or have respect for and you know it's been done with video games and it's been done with tabletop gaming but that's the negative side of it right positive side is i wouldn't have half the stuff on my shelf right now if kickstarters didn't exist Right, right, and you know, and, and and like I said, there there are some practices, and if you go online and you and you talk to, you get in these Kickstarter groups and stuff, and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll tell you practices are things like I said, your game, making a game, your game should be done, as done as you yes. can make it. 
as you can possibly make it without the Kickstarter. Like you don't say, well, I'm going to use the money to take a week, you know, a couple months off work. If it, no, 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 yep. finish your freaking game. Like, yeah, you can buy the art with it, and yes, you can pay editors with it, and yes, you can pay a layout person for it, you know, and and buy your your cover for your game, you know, your your box cover, your book cover, or whatever. That's mm -hmm. fine, but the material, the meat, all the roll, all the test playing, all that should be done. Yeah, I don't. Or at least should be in like late alpha stages. I don't. Uh, I do know where it comes from. It's the risk model, where they're so afraid of the risk, putting all their skin in the game up front. They want to go and get people to put their skin in the game, and this is a constant problem of raising venture capital. And right. porn, porn again, prove that that's the model. It has to be. It has to be free first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so like, I I love the Kickstarter stuff, and I think some of the 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 craziest things we've seen out of Kickstarter. Let's take the Matthew Mercers and the Matt Covilles out of the picture. They, they had a following off of one – well, Matt Mercer and them had Critical Role. And right. then you have Matt Coville, who worked in the video game industry and tabletop industry and is really good at giving advice for new to middle grade communities. Some high end, but more in that, that the big bracket. But then if you look at things like they come out of nowhere, you remember the spinner rings that came out mm -hmm. with the dice on them? Yeah. The crit success, what were they called? They blew yeah. up. That never would have happened any other way. Right. Mm, right. You can't take somebody who designed jewelry for a living and then make something for gaming and make something that awesome in that accessory range. Um, I, I love it. I think it's awesome. And I think that it just right now my problem with it is I, I want guidelines, not from Kickstarter, but as a community that are blanketed and put out. And it's like the Chicago writing thing where you just know, don't do this, do do this. Transparency is everything. But there's a level of transparency you can't be. Like, there, there's just some teaching that needs to happen so third-party publishers aren't going out and failing. Yeah, yeah, because we don't want them to fail. We want all those people to succeed. You know, we want right. anyone who puts out a Kickstarter, you want them to succeed. Yeah, and eventually, there's a lot of people in the industry, and I don't agree with this, believe that once you're able to be self-sufficient, you shouldn't do Kickstarter anymore. Well, I don't, no. I don't agree with that. Don't it, is a, that. it is a model that you are paying for at the end of the day where they take money from you and allows you to hit an audience. It is a platform just like TV is for advertising. Um, if you can build a community there, then you shouldn't abandon it. Correct. Wherever your community is is where you should be, and yeah. you should be trying to build one in other spots to grow. But they, they believe people like Monica Games and Paizo should not be on Kickstarter. It's only for indie. I'm like, well, there's a company called Indiegogo, if you really want to argue terminology. And right. I, think, I think that it's fine because you know what you're getting into. The small guy thinks that they're taking away. But if you actually look at the Kickstarter number, does that pool is so big? No one's losing money because another Kickstarter is going on. You're losing money because you did not put your skin in the game. Right. And and if, if anyone, like, and I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, uh, Stegmeier has a book out on Kickstarters, and it is mm -hmm. fantastic. And his number one rule, like you said, is to build community. He's like, yep. that. if you do not build community, you will not fund your Kickstarter. It's just well, no, happen, unless it's really small. When I was raising money for video game industry, doing like rounds of VC, you, you had to have a relationship with them. I mean, you were doing Shark Tank. You're going in and pitching and walking away, and you couldn't be defeated. You, you had to feel good about it, even if they maybe they just didn't like what you were doing. This right. is the same thing where you, instead of, though, five people backing you, you're talking between 500 to 5,000 backing you, and you have a large audience to keep happy. And that is a stressful thing. Like when I consult for Kickstarters, I tell people, if you don't take constructive criticism, well, have somebody else handle your media yep. and have somebody else handle all your comments. Cause it is going to hurt because only people who are angry speak up because people are happy are happy. They're content. Right. right. Yeah. Lots of when money somebody, in a silent community is still a good community. When somebody looks at it, you know, and they're, they're like, I, you know, these colors are all horrible or whatever, you know, you might, a reply to that might be, I'm, I'm really sorry you didn't like the colors. I, you know, I, yeah. I have a group of people that did and, and I, I guess we can't please everybody. And if you want your money back, send it back to me and I'll, I'll pay you back. You can't go, well, fuck you, man. I, yeah. My colors are great. You're an asshole. Oh yeah. That One is person is like the colors happen. for all, you know, they're colorblind and don't know it. Right. <laughs> right. I've exactly. actually had this happen with numerous clients, like doing graphic design. You go in and put it down like, that's not the right color. I'm like, it's it's a hundred percent the right color, and I'll show you the co the numbers that show you. I'm like, you might might not see this color the same as everybody else, and and honestly, me sitting next to someone, a color will be different. Yeah. So that is a common problem, but you can't piece them. You can give them their money back, 
Or you can explain it and hope they're happy. And if they're not, you give them money. You're back. colorblind, Eric. Well, I'm 100 percent colorblind. I would be screwed <laughs> as a designer. Yeah, that's true. That's true. No, oh, I promise it's red. Let, let's talk a little bit about these audio guided adventures. Uh, you mm. mentioned it before, but like, like let's go through it a little bit, a little more detail. Okay. Like, what do you do that's audio guided adventures? Do you want the process of how I'm building it, or more what the adventure is? Well, uh, kind of what it is. Like, what okay. what is an so audio the, guided adventure? The concept for me was this: um, I subscribed to Adventure Path for a long time, and I don't have time to read sixty page adventures and run them. Okay, um, and I don't run as a GM in that way. I am known for running my own stuff, and everyone wondered how I prepped. I was like, I should really put this together. And what I was finding trying to design my own adventures and not follow the same format we've seen since the 80s is that they're not going to be able to run it the right way unless I'm actually telling them how to run it, explaining my process and my momentum and, and what I'm doing. So the way the adventures come, uh, it's usually between four to eight pages total. That's including cover sheet and, like, cutouts. Um, and how the cover and the first part you're going to see is going to be a map that is blank, and that is one you can show the players for wherever they're at. The next one will be a plot web. That plot web is got specific icons uh, denoting, like, this is a key item you need to find. This is a plot hook. This is a possible encounter. And those are frames around them that are, like, a hook, a key, or an explosion, or a trap, which looks like a bear trap because we all know what that is. And they're systemless currently, although I'm doing some 5e ones as a test run. And then there are numbers next to them, and those numbers are matched to an audio track. And I basically give you an audio CD. Uh, the first one is the longest audio track. It's three minutes explaining what the adventure is. Everything after that is usually like 30 to 45 seconds, some only 15. Um, I do a lot of voiceover work, and I have friends that do. I have them come and record stuff or send things to me if I want, like, a monster and how they sound or how they speak. And it's not for them to play it at the table. They can, but it's to teach them how to sound like that NPC if they want to mimic the tone. Okay. Um, we also do uh, people who come in, and they will do some, like, read-over script if there's someone who's giving an announcement in an area. We will do stuff like that. And it guides you through the process of how I'm doing it. And there's space around this plot web for you to make your own notes on how you want to run it for your system and what you want. Mm -hmm. In the bottom corner, there's an easy, medium, and hard, because let's be honest, all games break down to that. Uh, and you can put whatever your system you're running in the box, whatever your difficulty might be, however many dice you need to roll, whatever it needs to be. And on that plot web, it'll just have the E, the M, or the H there, so you know what you should be going with. Um, they're, leveled, they're made for rough level sizes and level scopes. And then the last page is that same map, but with the plot web important piece, in the area on the map they're at. So you have just two pieces of paper you look at while you're running. That's it. Um, some of the more advanced ones have pieces you can cut out and uh, you can hand your players if there's like a piece of the map you want them to see but not the whole thing until later, things along those lines. What I've found happens is GMs start running games in their own voice instead of running them in the voice of the writer. Cool. And that was the game plan. I wanted them to be their own GM because everyone tries to mimic Matt Mercer or, or you know, Coville or other people they watch. It's Team Phoenix. I didn't want that. I want people to feel that they can run their own stuff. Like, there's no reason to be them. Learn from them, but be you. You know, and that's going to – that's we're going to come back around to that in just a little bit because you had some questions for me. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were for me and Mike, but it's really for me because Mike doesn't really game master. So <laughs> He plays, though, so he has to watch you do it. Right. So – um, uh, I don't uh, watch, but, but, but part of, I play, I play with him with my eyes closed. <laughs> Easy now. All right. So, so let's, a... let's, so before we run out of, uh, run out of time for that, let's get into grimmer space. Cause I know that's a big discussion. Um, we've, I've yes. been talking to, uh, to Lou about that. Um, I don't know when that's coming out or when he's going to do the Kickstarter or whatever, but oh. he was going to come on here to do a promo for it. Um, and apparently it's, it's a big deal. It's uh... I, I know a lot, on, on, and it's from two years of working with these fools. Uh, and I mean that in a loving way. They're two of my best friends. Uh, Roan and Lou are part of the reason I got into the industry. Um, they were running all their big parties they do on Saturday nights at Gen Con, and I had won Iron GM, or no, first year I'd taken third and wasn't even supposed to GM, and they're like, hey, come to our little after party, and I did, and since then, I never turned back, and, and that's, you know, how you freelance. Uh, so I'm looking down because I have a media kit here that he sent me. 
So I can give you a bunch of stuff. The two things I should probably tell you up front, and they're going to be opposite of what he wants up front. Um, there is a free adventure out right now, uh, Avatar 8. It is all of the setting material they put out is set on how grim it is, it is it and what it is. And this one's got like, there's like a scale on the side and it's marked slaughter. It is a blood fest, horror hack and slash feel in space and two silos. Um, they brought me on to do all the maps for it. So there's also a separate map pack you can download. Free as well until in, into June. June 22nd, I believe they pull it off from being free. Um, and that map pack has all the maps and handouts. And every single map has a player version and a GM version. So no more of that handing them stuff and there's notes all over it. Um, so we did that. The that adventures. Uh, Abattoir 8. I can send you a bunch of stuff if you want to you know, yeah. put in the show notes afterwards. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Um, so that's the, the big thing. That's out right now. The Kickstarter starts the 22nd of May. So that's right around the corner. I know Lou and Roan are scrambling and kind of, you know, getting everything finalized, ready to go. I've seen a lot of the book already. It's so awesome. His layout artist is amazing. Sean Astin is part of the project. Uh, you know, Rudy, Lord of the Rings. Yep. Um, he is... Bob! A, Bob! Yes, Bob, if that's what you know him from. Um, I know him from Strain. Uh, he's, he's fantastic. He is part of this kind of looking over and doing some creative direction with everything with Ruone and Lou. What I just found out, though, and I don't have the numbers on this, is he he told me the some of the goals you can kick in at. Dude, the pricing on this is so cheap, I don't know how they're doing it. Like, you're getting a hardback book for, like, $40. Wow, okay. And it's over 200 pages right now. Damn, that's actually pretty good nowadays. Yeah, that's over. Yeah, that's pretty good. And that, oh, and that also gives you, like, I believe, all the PDFs. Okay. As well. So none of that like split level crap. Right. right. Um, and there's like, three or four levels in it. There's some really cool things coming up. I can't talk about, of course, because <laughs> there always are. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully he'll be announcing some stuff later this week. If you go to GrimmerSpace.com, that has the rest of their information. You can sign up for their newsletter. There's links for the two different uh, uh, pieces for the first adventure as well. And then they've done a series of videos explaining the different factions too. So if you're on Instagram or Facebook and you find Grimmer Space or Iron GM Games, you'll learn about the Vote Again factions and all the different groups that are involved. Pretty cool little video things that they did at a, I believe they did at a comic book shop in New York, if I'm not mistaken. They're just kind of recording yep. it all and doing their thing. Yeah, we've been Last- there. The What's Iron that? GM space, the Iron GM um, Twitter is pretty lit with all that stuff. I was yeah, was yeah, and and I will say this: this setting is not for the faint of heart. You can run it PG, PG thirteen, but this is a this is a dark, oh, why gritty would you? sci-fi game, low magic, like low. Everything is tech, and what they did is they wanted to make a Starfinder compatible setting that felt more akin to. Aliens Alien, and yeah. in, in non-magical sci-fi settings, science fiction more than space magic fiction. That's good. And I, like uh, that. I do too. And the art for it is amazing. There is okay. some stuff in there that I don't know should be on paper. Like Guy Gaxian uh, in 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 the old school feel, but the color they're doing is treated more like concept art for video games. Nice. Wow. So it has that kind of crunchy, dark and gritty ink feel for some of it. Uh, some of the painters he had for digital stuff are pretty amazing. I know he's going to be announcing those over the next couple of weeks. And then is there anything else I can tell you? I'm looking through street dates right now. Um, I know that Modefius is taking a big part in shipping this for overseas for all you overseas people. Okay. You don't have to worry as much. I think they're kind of striking a deal with them. And uh, I think that's all I can say as of today, because he's got one tomorrow that he's doing, and then I'm doing some stuff at MegaCon for it. Um, if you are going to be at MegaCon, I can say Sean Aston's going to be there as well. Um, badger him about Grimmer Space. That's what I would do. <laughs> nice. nice, nice. All right, cool. And and we know Lou does great stuff. Because yes. Because yeah. if you've seen the Razor Coast stuff, that was f- off the hook really cool. And I had a blast sure working this, on that, this, too. I'm sure this is the next level. I mean, like you know, because you get better at your at your craft. Yeah, you yeah. Something. 
Yeah, if you liked Razor Coast and you loved all the like little charts in the back to keep you organized and all that kind of stuff, I can tell you that the adventure that came out right now has stuff like that in it. Okay. Cool. Awesome. 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 All right. So questions from for for me. Yeah. Uh, all right. So question number one: What needs to be in a product in order for both the GM and the player side of you to buy it, or for side? Uh, side of you. So basically, the, the player and the GM side of you, because I didn't know there was somebody else in the show. Okay. All right. So, yeah, so for thanks, me, bud. so for for me, uh, flexibility to insert it into an existing campaign. So, like okay. you were saying with the 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 two page that you got that mm-hmm. that's wide open, and so you're, you're getting the concept and like things that must happen, but mm-hmm. you're not so structured that you couldn't easily introduce any party that you already have. The plug and play. That's a plug and play, right? Because our group, we get into these campaigns. And we get involved with all kinds of stuff that's going on. And then, like, you know, if, if there's an adventure that is specifically set for a certain type of character, it's like, uh, it's going to be really hard to run this adventure because it's set for a certain kind of party, and that's not going right. to work. Um, another thing that I uh, that I like in an uh, adventure is clues and information slash bonuses for doing stuff outside of combat to help inside the adventure. So, uh, so the, the, the action part of the adventure. So... Let's say you're going to go into a dungeon, right? But you start out in a town, and you should be able to. I mean, I, I want to have stuff in that town where I can I can ask questions, I can research at the library. Uh, if I help someone in need on a little side quest beforehand, they might give me something. Hey, here, take this. You'll need this. You know, like for the video games, um, or info gained gained from a previous adventure. Um, had the characters done things outside of just hack and slash. So in other words, getting involved, doing other things that would help you. So for example, two Mahars would be, two Mahars mm-hmm. to me is a horrible adventure for anyone to play. I, I get what it's for. I get, I, I know what, what it was made for and it works to that end. But if you wanted to use it for something else, what if you had this town outside of the tomb and there was all this, this information you could find out about what's in the tomb. Like if you went to the library and you researched and like you found out about, you know, that there's that one doorway you walk through and you're just dead. There's no savings. So yep. There's no nothing. You're just gone, right? Yep. Well, if you had done your homework in the town, you might be like, "Oh, I'll know this door because there'll be a symbol over top of it." So now I won't go through it because I did my homework. Um, yeah. But if you just go headlong into the dungeon and you all get killed, well, then, well, you know, you should have taken your time. It was really dangerous. Should done your homework. Yeah. So, so if an adventure has that kind of stuff, where like you can have a brutal dungeon or a brutal whatever a spaceship or whatever it is you're going into. Um, but your characters have all the opportunity in the world to be prepared for that. And if they do everything right, they could actually cakewalk through the thing, which you, mm-hmm. they'll never do everything right. But let's say they let's say they did, right? They could go through that adventure and they would have a great time, just mm-hmm. you know, and and they would feel good because they'd be like, yeah, we really prepped for this, you know, and and we got rewarded for it. Yeah. Um, but that's the kind of stuff I like to have in, a, in an adventure, and like a big like a big good beefy gaming product. 10, right. 10, uh, it's 10 o'clock, just letting you know, time. I know. You know how I'm, just, uh, I'm good time-wise. If you guys aren't, that's yeah. different. We can go a little bit, Mike. I'm fine with it if you guys are. Uh, yeah, just, you know. Yeah. I mean, I you can record so. it. It's going to get ported out. You at least get the right length you're supposed to have. <laughs> okay. Well. So, all right. So, uh, so the second part, or the last last bit to this first question was is. And uh, for players. And this, this is not needed, but is preferred. Yeah. Uh, like I said before, an open-ended approach to an adventure. So, um, so you could play it as mercenaries, or mm-hmm. maybe as agents of an organization, like soldiers, cops, gangsters, whatever, like an organized mm-hmm. group, or even as the bad guys. So you could take an adventure from different, like, let's say it's to go into the dungeon. Well, let's say you you you're playing like an evil party, right? Not a lot of people do this, but some people do. Maybe the the guy running the dungeon or owns the dungeon, or whatever, hires you. To stop adventurers, which would be really cool if you could run the adventure like in reverse. You know what I mean? I am writing something like that for Grimmer Space right now, where it is a undead c- creature that his entire ship is set up is mazes and labyrinths that he hires people to come in and do work in. And the players get that ship. That's the start of the adventure. Oh, cool. Now you got to decide what to do with that ship. Are you going to keep doing his job or try to help everyone get all the lost souls back that died there? Okay. That's cool. Um, and then, all right, so second question, because we've got to burn through this a little bit. Uh, what helps you organize as a GM, and has anything new made you go, I have to have that for my process? Um, 
I so point one is copies of the characters or at least important info on them like perception or search checks or weaknesses, phobias, hunteds, enemies and stuff at my disposal. So it's not just on their character sheet where I have to remember it as a game master. I mm-hmm. should have all the important stuff that makes the adventure fun. Um because yeah, ACs and hit points don't actually matter. What's that? A- AC and hit points don't matter. Right. That's it's everything worried else. about that. Right. It's like, for example, if they need to make a perception check, but I don't want them to know they're making a perception check, I roll for them and I can look at their score. Right. right. And then they made it or they didn't make it, and they don't know whether they made it or not. They okay. just know I rolled a die. They can hear it. And that's that's fun because you can just roll dice and like everybody, oh, shit, what's going on? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's, hmm? it's not fun. It's not fun. It's a lot of fun. Every uh, GM not. does it. <laughs> uh, and another one is um, easy to use NPC cards or sheets for mooks. So I okay. like having all my easy kill villains. Like, you know, for, for like a big villain, you want to have like a full sheet or whatever. But I like mm-hmm. having little like cards for villains so I can just like pull out a little card and I can like like just mark off shit real quick. Um, and make one, like if I have 20 mooks that are going to come at you, maybe I have like a card that has like 20 boxes on it that represents one, each box represents a mook, so it's easy for me to keep track, because there's nothing like having like the mook's stats or like a low-level villain's stats, and right. you're just like, oh, I got 20 of these, so let me write down 20 hip, you know, I, all that stuff's <laughs> got to be ahead of time. Do you, uh, then do you like your monsters and NPCs at the back of the book so you can just photocopy them and print them? Or do you like them in the stat block in the adventure? Uh, for organization. Wow. That is a good, that's a good question because there's two schools of thought. It's nice to have it right there, right? Yeah. But it's also nice to have it in the back. Maybe both. I don't know. That might hmm. be too much to ask. Or, wait a minute. No, no. I know. You buy the book. They're in the stat block, but you have a PDF you can print out that that okay. has like a sheet that you can print out. Everything print out. together. That I find work. the same thing. I, I I run into those problems. Uh, is there anything new you've bought for your process, like uh, like accessories or things that you use? Are you a? Is there anything that you've bought that makes your life easier? Like everyone yeah. buys that new initiative tree, but I've always used the initiative box. Well, I don't. I don't really play D and D, but I'll tell you what I like to do. I'll, I play a lot of Savage Worlds at conventions, like so. I like sure. to run Savage because it's really easy to run, and you can you can go crazy with it. And you don't have to explain a mm-hmm. lot. I take a dry erase board, and I just draw like out the scenes and the characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, you know, it's like you can run so far. I say, well, that's about here to here. You know, it's it's all conceptual. And with a dry erase, I can just rub off somebody and then like put another mark down or I can write next to them that they're stunned or, or sure. shaken rather or whatever. Um, is that something really they see like or is that. that for you? What's that? Is that for them or you? It's for them. They, they okay. can see it. So it, it, gotcha. it's a really easy tool for them to see what's going on. And you know, people don't need figures. I mean, like you, if you're a, a circle with a one next to it, they get it. Yep. I, I don't use figures very often anymore. I used to be really heavy into it and kind of, have fallen away a little bit. And, I, I like the players. One of those magnetic own. ones. You can get the little magnets that are like different colors. Yep. They work good too. Yep. So that's actually that's a really good prop. Do you have like a little easel you set it on, or do you just show it to them and put it back? No, set it right on the table. Oh, so you just lean over and draw. Like, yep. I do that on paper, but dry erase for that's pretty awesome. That's awesome. So, Paul, I, I just before because I know we're getting ready to switch gears, and my page just reloaded. So where the fuck does? Oh, Paul was saying. He said, please make post-apocalyptic maps uh, blending 20th century, 18th century, medieval, and primitive terrain. What? So I don't what know. Is, so what is I don't that know whether the terrain has to be question. medieval, mixed, you know, like it's time-traveling terrain, or I think he's just talking about, like, the types of buildings. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, Tales for the Loop did a little bit, but the new one coming out, everything has fallen in Tales for the Loop, and I think we might start seeing some of those maps from Modefius. Oh, you know what he was saying? He was saying that, so he runs a Mario Project game. Wow, that's so oh. old school. And he said that he needs locations that blend tech oh. levels, you know, because the society sure. is devolving. Monty Cook Games. Okay. Newman era is uh, nine iterations of Earth. Okay. So there's just zany stuff through the whole maps, if you find maps for them. So look through MCG stuff. You might find some maps that you need. Okay. Well, there and that's, you have it. That's it. That's what I got. That's what I got. No, so, what about him, player-wise? What needs to be in a book for you? Yeah, Mike. Uh, he doesn't I do haven't, books, really. <laughs> I haven't been playing much in the past couple of years. So What? Yeah, I know. I'm lame. Um, He's been invited. Yeah. 
been invited. Right, see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. See, been invited. It, it's it's uh to me it's an addiction, and it's like one is too many, and one thousand is never enough. And uh, so I, I, I I I really I really love my relationship right now. <laughs> oh no no! I, I mean know. I work eighty plus hours a week, and I still game on Sundays. Dude. Have to Friday nights. Yeah, I don't. Friday nights. Oh, stop! Stop, stop it! Stop it! Stop I'm it. helping you guilt him, just early so you know. on Saturdays and goes to work. But I will say that uh, Pete, you, you know me. You know my style. You know, like I'm the type of person that I, I love the theatrical stuff. I love. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a huge uh, cyberpunk fan. Me too. And um, I anything that helps things become more realistic to, to me, it doesn't have to as much be um, sounds and lighting. Although I really enjoyed playing like, you know, like Andre Krupa's game. Yeah. Um, that was, that was a fun, interesting experience. Can't um, do it every time. It, yeah. And it did enhance it, but uh, you know, a good storyteller um, and you know, Pete's pizza actually is a really good storyteller too. someone who can just, you know, really bring you into the story and, and help you, you know, be just as enthusiastic. I think is probably you like th- we've played games where you don't even need other things. If you have good storytelling and and, a, and some good framework, honestly, that's that's paramount. I'm gonna grab one thing that's new tech that we didn't talk about. And we can move on after this. If you want something that is tech and the best merger of technology and gaming, this may be one of my favorite games to come out. Okay. Short version, app on your phone, six dice, one side wild, one side bad. Everything else is an element. Tarot card size, there's a set of element tarot and a bunch of image tarot. And you pick the adventure style you want to play. There's one that's like the Goonies. There's one that's like Star Wars. So on and so forth, play sets on your phone. GM goes, what are we playing? You pick it. You hand out their spread of cards, and they flip them over one at a time. It scanned them, and it asks them questions to build their character for that setting wow that's and then cool. you play it digital and you just have your phones out and you play it tell a story together these have been some of the best stories i've ever told and it's six simple dice with elements on them hmm. pete what was the game that we played at uh total con the uh the the one that ran us through she um petra ran us through petra sorry oh, fiasco fiasco is right cool. Yeah, fiasco. That this was that was an that, awesome game. This has got to kind of feel that with a little more yeah. um, fun to it, more storytelling. But okay, soon creators are gonna be able to make their own stuff for this. Nice. And, and all right, so Eric, I I want to say because I was at I was at Gary Con sure probably four maybe what Pete was it four years ago when I went with you. Three, I vaguely remember meeting you with him. Yeah. Right. Like and we played uh, the Adventures of Baron Mon Munchausen. Oh, Mon- Munchausen? Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Like we all sitting around all tr- that was seat like they that. Say <laughs> that was the be- that was the well, best. I was told game. you flew to the moon on a hot air balloon. Yeah, I remember yeah. those games. Yeah, that's yeah. how I. That's one of my favorite Gen Con games. That's a fun game. That was a lot of fun. All right, we're on time. So Mike, game time. Game, game time. Game time. We're gonna go to game. What, what are we playing? Well, you'll oh. find out. But before that, real quick, everybody, go to patreon.com forward slash Eric. It's E-R-I-K, Frank House, F-R-A-N-K-H-O-U-S-E, presents, yep. P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. He has a Patreon. We didn't talk about it, but no. you, you do stuff for... I do a lot of stuff on there. There's patrons. I do a podcast. I do patron stuff. I do live videos. I do high twos. Um, I haven't really been promoting it because I've just been rebuilding what I want to be. Um, and that's only because people have been wanting l- different things. I also have Drive Through RPG, same name. Eric Frankhouse presents. Yep. And right. and your own face face the Facebook. Mundo Facebook. Yes. I'm on the Twitters. I'm on the Instagram. If you want my maps, mostly my Instagram. Um, I'm all over the place. If you if you type in Eric Frankhouse, you'll find it. It's all <laughs> you'll find yeah. you'll 100 find me. Right. You don't even need the link and, really. But and his beard. Right. And my beard. And you will beard. find my beard. I make beard oil. Oh, wait a minute. You make that? That's yours? That you, you make that's that? That's mine. I make oh. those. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I saw you were selling some, and I was like, what is this, a flea market? No, no, no. no. I, make those, I make those things. Good old Beard Brigade. I made them because I don't like everything smelling like patchouli. Oh, good. We hate patchouli. Nice. Yeah, yeah, this is like a modern-day red spice. The other one has hops in it. Nice. Smell like yeah. a beer. 
Well, and about, lemongrass and stuff. How yeah, about, that'd be great if your beard smelled like weed. That'd be that'd be cool. Yeah, it's more of a summer. They're <laughs> diametrically opposed, but that is for a different show. <laughs> All, right, All right, Pete, let's, come on. Let, let's see if I can do this without screwing it up. Oh, mm. I got ten dollars <laughs> that he does. I don't know. I couldn't get audio to work on my computer. I rebuilt, so that was here, fun. Here we go. All right, no, it worked. Yay. All right, it's game time with the Mythwits. I'll be your game master this week, and we'll be playing Bet the Geek. I have taken questions directly from Cube of Death. Each round, oh, no. I will ask Eric a D&D trivia question. All right. Before he answers, Mike and I will guess whether Eric will get the answer correct or get it wrong. Um, Mike and I must also hedge our bets by one, two, or three points based on how confident we are in Eric's D&D foo. Uh, once all betting is in, Eric will reveal his answer. Mike and I each start with 10 points. We'll begin with three warm-up questions, so you can answer these right away to help us gauge Eric's abilities. Good luck, everybody. And now it's time for Bet the Geek. So, Eric, this is how this works. I'm going to ask you these next three questions I'm going to ask you, you can answer right away. That's just yeah. for us to get a feel for your D&D knowledge. All but right. Then, once the actual game starts, don't answer them. I'll ask you the question. Mike and I will bet whether you're going to get it right or wrong. And then when I tell you to, you'll reveal your answer and we'll get points or we'll lose points. So skew yeah. the game for who I want to win. Check. What's that? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So here's our first warm-up question. Uh, what breath weapon does a white dragon have? These are all D&D questions. Okay. All D&D. All right. Uh, it is cold or frost, and it is usually a cone. Fantastic. All right. That is correct. Let's see if I can get my thing here. All right. Uh, are the elemental... I didn't hear it. Did anyone else hear that? I didn't hear it. <laughs> are the elemental planes inner planes or outer planes? Outer. No, they are. Oh, D and D. They're inner planes. You're right. What? God, Eric. Everybody knows that. <laughs> no. What are the only two types of damage that a troll cannot regenerate from? Fire and acid. Fantastic. That's their marrow, there and it's five e. There you go. All right. So now you're ready to play. So these questions you will not answer until we talk okay. to. All right. So first question. First question. I'm going to put the camera I am ready for gotta... your questions. Right. <laughs> in, and, and I knew you were old enough to answer this. So in first edition AD&D, what is the maximum charisma for a half orc? So Mike, you're going to go Ooh. first on this one. What do you think? Will Eric know the maximum charisma for a half orc character? Hmm. Uh, Eric, how tall are you? I'm uh, five foot eleven. Hmm. I'd say that's half orc height. So. I mean, that's um, true. Uh, I'm gonna say two points, and he knows it. All right. So you're saying yes, he's gonna know it for two points. I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna be as adventurous. Uh, I'm no, you say, don't trust me. I'm gonna say. It's a D&D first edition and could be confusing between the... Uh, um, I did play I'm, a lot. I'm going to... Um, yeah, but confused. you didn't know the indies from the outies, so... Yeah. No, that's a tough question. That was a tough question. I'm going to I'm gonna go yes for one. I'm going to be a little more conservative. All right, Eric. So I remember halfling specifically, and that is the problem that I'm having right now because that... I'm going to say 12. Because I think halflings were 17, and I think orcs were 12. And you I think... know what? That is correct. Okay. Is it really? Okay, because yes, I was going to say, then, then I don't remember what elves were. Weren't they 18? Doesn't Why matter. Remember, it does does not matter. matter. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, all right, here's question number two. In 5E, what is the highest level bard spell? And I'll go first on this one. I'm going to say Eric plays a lot. 5e has really been big. Everybody loves yeah. Bard. So I'm going to say that he knows this one for two points. Mike? Eric, your yes. poker face is good. Mm -hmm. but it is not that good, my friend. Are you sure? Oh, I am sure. Positive? Do you, do you think what? I not play 5e? Hey, three points. My skin is in the game. You know it. So here's the deal. It changed. Uh, they used to have a limited amount of spells, and now yeah. they go all the way to ninth. 
Correct. Correct him. Boom. Mike, the answer was my... on your face the whole time. Mike, you're beating me. You're beating me. So Does he not usually win? Uh, no, he wins sometimes. Yeah. No, it's okay. it's it's about fifty fifty. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say uh, uh, for the audience for the for the audio audience, Mike has a fifteen and I have a thirteen. So we're 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 still close, pretty close. Um, you know, Mike, I was gonna move the double damage to the end, but the way I got the score set up in the chart thing here, I'm just gonna go ahead and use it now. All right, so this one is a double damage round. Eric. Okay, double jeopardy check. So what this means is, Mike. Just mm -hmm. because just this is me and you here. Whatever we bet, whatever amount we bet is for both of these. Ooh. So he's going to get asked a question and then a follow-on question. Right? So you could, if you bet three, you could earn up to six or lose up to six. Right. That's how or, double or works. You could, or right. you could break zero. Or it could be zero. Because right. you could get the first one and then lose the second one. Just putting that out. Just pointing that out. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Eric... In first edition D A D and D, how okay. much damage versus a small or medium opponent does a longsword do? Mike, what do you think? Hmm. First edition D and D, how much damage versus a small or medium opponent does a longsword do? So I have to bet, like if I say two points, he knows it. Then yes. the follow up question. Will be two points. We'll also go for two points. So I can't say he doesn't know the follow up. I no, have you to can. Say he you can say that. he doesn't know the follow up. Oh. It, the points okay. are the only thing that's well, the same. Well, he knows this. Okay. So I know he knows this. Do you I? Know I? Yes. Uh, two points. <laughs> two points. All My right. hypothetical was a real thetical. All right. So I'm going to say yes because a long sword is like, that's the sword everybody, well, either that or the bastard sword, but the long sword was one that everybody <laughs> took. I, I, he's got to know this, and I'm gonna. I'm, you know what? I'm going full in. I'm going oh, full in. got All your right, skin Eric. in the game, buddy. Okay, so I, I, I can't remember if the d the day the die damage changed is my question. Daggers were. I'm gonna say I think it still was a, a d8 back then. That is correct. I don't think that's ever changed. That's because uh, there are some damages that have changed. All right, here's your follow-up question. Hey, right. Paul Cooley. Paul Cooley just jumped in the chat. <laughs> Hi, Paul. This, so, uh, so here's your follow-up. How much damage does it do against a large opponent? Mike, yeah. what do you think? You think he's got this one? A large opponent as opposed to a small opponent. Yeah. In uh, D&D, there was like small, medium, and large, and weapons could do different damage. Right, right, because, you know, Starbucks. It was a Venti or a Grande. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Um, okay, so... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, God, that's what it was. Fuck, dude, I... I, I Mike, gonna you say to know the answer. You just need a, to know what I'm a point. A point says he knows it. No, 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 two points, because you bet two points already. So oh, I have to go with point to say, yeah, all right, yes. so then, well, I'm... All right, let's keep my skin right on the tip for two points. All right, two points, okay. all right? And I'm going to say... Look like yeah, how he's hiding his eyeballs right now. <laughs> Eric, I think you're going to pull it out of your ass. I'm going to say yes, you're going to know it too. Okay. If I remember, I think Paizo pulled the extra damage from that chart. Does it go to a D12? That is correct. Fantastic. Man, look at I this. I don't like that. That's a what shitty question. <laughs> so we just... hey. We just tied up, Mike. We just tied up. All right. All right. That's all right. Uh, all right. Question number four. Can you answer both of them? I, I, How can you ask about FACO? Uh, I'm, I, it, all right. Question number four. I, I what magic ability does a clear ion stone grant? And oh, I'll geez. go first. I'm going to say, oh, hell no. He ain't going to know what, this What one. edition? Uh, ooh, oh, they changed. Uh, what's well, first edition, I believe. Yeah, first edition. I guess. I'm pretty sure it was first edition. God, I hope it is. <laughs> I'm going to say no for one. Mike, Could you repeat the question? I was chatting with yeah. Paul. What? Stop. Pay attention to the game. What magic ability does a clear ion stone grant? <laughs> Look at Mike. He's like, what's an ion stone? An ion stone? <clears throat> it's so simple. Uh... Let's see. Game face. Yeah, game face. I'm going to say he knows it for three. 
Everybody knows what an ion stone is. You get them at Brookstone. It it keeps your air clean. Right. I mean, no, it does not do that. Uh, and it is also usually a spindle. Um, I, I, I remember this vividly because every player in the world wants it because they don't want to have to worry about food or water. Yes! And if they can't get that, they look for the ring, and they're the most annoying player ever. I usually boot them immediately from the table. Damn it. You know what, Mike? You just pulled ahead of me. <laughs> I have 18. Mike has 22. Shit. I got to make some shit happen here. He said, pulled ahead. <laughs> All right. All right. Nice. So, I like it. Uh... Last question. In 5E, what hit okay. die is the Warlock? Mike, oh. I'm going to make you go first, being that you're leading. Uh, three knows it. Okay, so uh, yes, for three. And you know what I'm going to do? My just least favorite class. Just because it's it's game theory, I'm going to say no for three because it's the only chance I have of winning. It's... Right. it's <laughs> It is my least favorite class. Okay. Um, I'm going to say it's a D6. That is wrong. It is a D8. D8. Ah, oh, I couldn't remember if they were like a... Hey, you best. You know what? You didn't have to play it off like that. If you want to peak the win, you just should have said so. <laughs> hey, I didn't remember. Right. It's my least favorite class because I think it's poorly designed. They're just a cannon. Right. Hey, yeah. Mike. It should be. should be D8. Here's your winner. I think um, it's, I thought it was a D six. I'm sorry. Right. Twenty one to Mike's nineteen. Pete, I, I, I was serious when I'm telling you. I'm not hearing the sounds. I don't know if the people in the in on the out you really the feed are, hearing. but okay. no one in the room is not hearing the sounds. Hearing what okay, sounds? Maybe they aren't. Exactly. Oh, well. There's sounds. <laughs> yeah, he has a little sound effect sorry, button thing. Are you hearing this? Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh man, I had it turned off. Damn it! It was probably because I, I something else. Ah, fuck. Anyway, hey, but they get to hear this. Because this is the important sound, right, Mike? Right. Yes. That's your victory dancey music, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I feel good about it, you know? I felt What's good. Um, Deadpool it's all right, Washington. Eric. It's all right, Eric. You know, you're not, I'm sure I'm not the first person you've ever let down, so it's all good. <laughs> it's a daily a requirement for me. <laughs> <laughs> I seek it out. Were you looking forward to this? I'm sorry, I won't be there. Right. <sighs> all right. Well, Eric, thanks for coming on. I really, for really sure. appreciate you coming on. I, I love. I mean, I could talk game. To, I, I would talk to you for like four hours, and we have. Um, no, we haven't. Yes, we have. Today, no. <laughs> Today, <laughs> no. But I think I, I don't know how long we sat at Gary Con drinking beer, talking. Well, I was long. that was easily four to six hours. We drank right. <laughs> a lot. I brought a lot of beer that year. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I went home. I went home very drunk. Yeah. Are you very coming again this year? I might go next year. It's March. We're already done this year. We already did it. Yeah, I might. I might go to Gary Con next year. Can you be at Gen Con? I will not be at Gen Con. I will not be at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. I can only do so many things, and and Mike yeah. forces me. Has forced me into going to. No, not really forced me. I want to go. It's Sigler Fest this year, so that yeah. that's an extra. What's that? I'm doing? Huh? It, it it's, it's a Scott Sigler is an author, and um, he has. Uh, it's not as. Um, it's not as self celebratory as it seems but he does he's there's a little it thing it's a fan fest that people go and um get together and hang out with them in in vegas vegas baby i'm it's absolutely a, throwing a frank house con are you kidding me that's an amazing idea he's he's uh there you he, go. He, he, hey, he invite us to frank books. house con we're there <laughs> he's written a bunch of novels a and he's, he's got kind of a rabid following and it's sure. i think it's like a hundred people show up it's not a big it's not intended to be a big convention it's like a bunch of friends getting together and hanging out it's like a club meetup yeah so That's it's yeah so exactly i love those those are some of my favorites so we're gonna go this year and we know a lot of the people in the in the sigler community as it were because he's one of my favorite art authors of all time and paul nice. Cooley's in the room too i don't know if he's going or not uh but uh but if he is that'll be cool too because he's he's in that he's also in that sigler family and he's a writer of his own as well um, so before anyway, we go i have to ask yeah. what is the painting behind you um okay so that one yeah the blue one that is That's the only um, one I can see. It, that is uh um pull it down, pull it down, Pete. Now, oh, yeah. now I'm drawing a blue. You don't have to do that. You don't have to pull it down. I'm just asking who it is. No, I just wanted the control. I see the dog in the background who's super excited. 
So uh, I know yeah, his he's name, always got his pups in the room. I'm drawing a blank at this very second, but it's it's the guy from uh, it's the captain, the sea captain from Jaws. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. Damn it! And I know his name. He's like my he's like one of my favorite literary character or any any kind of character of all time. Um, and this guy TJ, who's a friend of ours, uh, he he does like you know he's he's a local artist, and I sure. every once in a while I'll commission him to do like some kind of pop culture painting for me. And yep. um, and damn it, why can't I think of his name? I keep wanting to say Griff. It's not Griff. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's what that was. I broke the show. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'll think of it as soon as the show is over. We ask the questions, not you. Right, right. All right. Well, let's do it. Let's let's wrap this baby up. Here we go. Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw. Uh, yeah, but he was. Uh, oh, shit. Anyway, uh, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Um, tweet us at Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. Mythwits is produced by Aether Forge Creations as part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com and AetherForge.com for more cool stuff. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't change it, and don't attack a troll with it. He'll just regenerate the damage. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in, and we'll see you all next Monday. And Mike... You're talking about Shark Hunter Quint. Quint! Quint! Yes. And stay tuned for the Movie Draft Minute. All right, everybody.